30 seconds. We, we should be starting now. All right, welcome everybody. Oh, and, oh would you turn this microphone on too? I don't know if you heard me. Could, could you turn this? All right, great. All right, well, welcome everybody to this uh, half hour tutorial on fractals. Uh, I'm Chris Barton. My colleague and co speaker is Sean Lovejoy. And I can speak for both of us that we've been involved in looking at the fractal properties of systems in the earth sciences for at least 30 years each. Uh, I'm going to start off with just the basics of fractals. And Sean is going to talk about multifractals. So these first, I'm, I have words, but I also have pictures to illustrate. So on the, on the left, you see the river pattern. Uh, on the right, you see a, an electric discharge. And these are both, this whole books on the fractal properties of river networks, okay, written by the MIT people 20 years ago. Excellent, excellent work. And Mandelbrot and others were studying electric discharge and lightning. Now, these have this property called fractal. So what does it mean to be fractal? What is and what isn't fractal? Well, it turns out this is pretty straightforward. First of all, we're talking about a property of patterns always. And the property that we're talking about is termed scaling, OK? That's a property of patterns where the pattern repeats itself either exactly or statistically over a range of scales. All right. So this is all that fractals addresses, is the scaling of a pattern. It doesn't say anything more about the pattern. Okay? And I just say, well, what does scaling mean? Well, scaling in the case of fractals, the pattern of repeat is what's called scale invariant. That means you cannot tell the scale unless you have an object of known length, for example, in the image. And over here on the right, we have, as all geology students know, when you're taking a picture of a geologic pattern, you must have something of known scale in the photograph. It could be a hammer, it could be, here it's a lens cap, but this is a fake. That lens cap, I had made, and it's five, sorry, it's three meters in diameter, okay? So you don't know the scale. It could be a big outcrop, it could be a hand specimen, it could be a thin section. Uh, the one on the bottom, of folding, is a thin section. So the scale there is about one or two centimeters across the bottom, okay? So the fact is folds, sedimentological stratigraphy, stratigraphy have these properties. And this is a cheap, easy way to know from the beginning, is my pattern fractal or power scaling? Because only power scaling has this property of scale invariance. And fractals are governed. This is the simplest form of the equation. It gets more complicated, but this is a power function. You would be fitting this to data. We'll go how to measure and collect data in a few minutes. And it's this power, the equation is a power function, and this d here is the scaling exponent or fractal dimension. Those two terms are interchangeable. All right. So, so in terms of the geometry of a pattern, when I was a student, which was before Mandelbrot started writing doing his work, we then you all learn geometry. A point has dimension one, a line, sorry, a point has dimension zero, a line is dimension one, a flat plane is two dimensional, and a volume is three dimensional. That's Euclidean geometry. Fractals branches off from Euclidean geometry by looking at what happens in between these integer dimensions. So for example, between 1 and 2. And here's an example. You have a straight line. It's dimension 1. Euclidean, fractal, everybody agrees. 
But what happens is that line becomes more wiggly. Huh? All right, more wiggly, more wiggly. Well, uh, in Euclidean geometry, a line is a line is a line and has only one dimension, and that dimension is one. I think the big breakthrough of Mandelbrot and others was to realize that wiggly lines lying in a plane lie between one and two. And so the more wiggly it becomes, they would say, they would say the, the more plane filling that line is. All right? It must also have the feature of the scaling, all right? which is it becomes the roughness goes along as well. So the fractal dimension for any geometric shape that is not a flat plane, a straight line, or a solid volume is going to be between 0 and 3. And here's a picture of Mandelbrot, the father of fractals, the man who coined the term fractal, and the mathematics behind a lot of what we'll see in the next few slides is in papers that he wrote. I think he wrote several hundred papers in his career uh, of the mathematical support for the things that we're going to see in the next slides. Okay, an example of, or two examples of synthetic fractals give you a sense of this. One is the triadic canter dust, all right? It's two versions, deterministic and random or stochastic. The rule here is start with a bar, break it into three pieces, and remove the middle piece. So this is what's called the generator. Then you repeat this. You iterate this, OK? And you're going to get a spacing of these line, little lines. And if you do it an infinite number of times, you iterate an infinite number, you'll get a pure fractal. That's what the mathematics says. In reality of applying this to the earth sciences or any other science, where we deal with a finite world, we don't iterate an infinite number of times. No pattern in nature is going to go to the infinitely small or the infinitely large. Even the longest faults on earth have some finite length. And you can't talk about their fractals, but you can't talk about faults that are bigger than the ones that you can actually observe. So you don't go to minus infinity or plus infinity. There are always upper and lower fractal limits that you must define in the pattern that you're looking at. So here's the deterministic version we just went through. Now, here's the twist on this, which is very important in terms of natural patterns. There's another factor. You don't see patterns, very, if ever, in nature that are like this deterministic. But here, the rule is still the same. Pull out the middle one third, all right? But now in the next iteration, the random number generator is used to determine which third gets pulled. Here it's the right end, oh, here it's the center, here it's the left end, here it's the center, center, left end, etc. So now you have a random number generator deciding which pieces will be pulled. And after just a few iterations, you end up with a fractal object whose fractal dimension you can calculate exactly, but this starts to look like something in nature, whereas this type of pattern does not. So it's the random or stochastic fractals that we are dealing with mostly uh, in looking at geologic, geophysical patterns. Here's an example, all right? Here's the reversal pattern of the Earth's magnetic field through time. Right? So it looks like a barcode. In fact, you could make barcodes, and they do make barcodes using random fractals. But things like this, this, we have a paper on this, Don Turcotte, this may be five or six papers analyzing this, and what we find is it's a beautiful fractal. It has a very specific fractal dimension. And People who make models, you can run those mo mathematical models for the self-reversing Earth's pattern, reversal pattern, and <coughs> only one of those puts out a fractal output. So the property of those models of scaling only exists in one, the Rikitaki dynamo model, which is a disk dynamo model from 1958. The new dynamo model from Harvard, which is a spherical model, 
much more complex is self-reversing, but the pattern of the reversals is not fractal, doesn't have the fractal dimension of the actual Earth's magnetic reversal pattern. So this is how these fractals can be used. Uh, we are working on climate right now and climate signals. And you can imagine we're doing the same thing. We're testing the models. And if they don't have a fractal output where the real data shows that there is a fractal output, then you know there's something more work needs to be done on the model. Here on the right is a, another object called a Sierpinski carpet. There's its fractal dimension. It's made by iterating. It has a set of rules. When it's deterministic, it looks like this. The random version looks like this. And the random version has been used extensively in the petroleum industry to model the size and spatial distribution of pores in various rocks. Uh, that's what they're interested in, greatly interested in. So you can read articles. There's thousands of articles on in the scientific literature of fractals being used to simulate real systems. All right, there are two types of fractals, self-similar and self-affine. Self-similar fractals, the pattern, like when we had the river pattern, all directions are equal. There's no x, y, they're all some distance and it's symmetric or circular. Self-affine fractals, the scales are different in different directions. All right, so a time series, which has time, let's say, on the x-axis, and some other variable on the y-axis, those two are not equal. They're not even the same units. They're not even the same system. So all time series or time series-like uh, data sets are self-affine. This is important because this tells you you have to know this from the beginning, so you use the right methods in measuring the fractal dimension of your patterns. Okay, so let's go to some methods. Method number one, the ruler method. This has been used extensively in shoreline work. One of my students uh, finished his master's degree last year looking at the roughness of the U.S. coastline from Canada to Mexico and from Mexico up to Canada, including the Great Lakes, all those shorelines, okay? And here's some shorelines as examples. And the, the method of the ruler, which you can read all about, is you, here's the rough piece of coastline, and you're going to walk it with rulers of different lengths. So these are all the same length in dark black in the dotted or dashed they're at rulers of a different length. So you change the ruler length. This goes back to Richardson, 1922. How long is the coastline of Great Britain? He measured it on maps with rulers of different lengths. And his answer was, it's a power function, of course, with the fractal, it has to be a power function. And the answer to the question is, if you were to go small enough, the length of the coastline of Britain is infinite. But in reality, the length of the coastline of Britain is a function of the scale at which you measure it. So if you measure it at the scale of one mile, let's say, in Britain, or 10 miles or 100 miles by walking the ruler, you're going to get different lengths. Map those lengths as a function of how many it takes. That's a power function. And so that there's one method. Now, next method, you could do the same thing with by laying on boxes. Instead of rulers, you overlay a grid of cells and you count how many are occupied. All right, so there's some small cells on this feature. And you count how many are occupied, then you increase the box size, how many are occupied, how many are occupied. You plot the size of the box versus how many are occupied. If it is a fractal scaling pattern, it will plot as a straight line in log log space. And the only function that plots as a straight line in log log space is the power function. So again, the power function is everything. There is, <laughs> Mandelbrot said if it's not power scaling, it's not scaling. He wouldn't even allow for log normal scaling or exponential scaling. 
He said it had to be power flaw or power function. Finally, you can do the box counting in the 3D cube counting. So you could have a wiggly line in 3D space, or you could have a system of a set of points like this. This could be pores in a rock, uh, their location at the center of the pores. This has been done, and you can do it in 3D and talk about the fractal dimension in 3D of that pattern. You talk about it, you can quantify it. I think it's important to understand the fractal analysis is a mathematical analysis that allows you to quantify the scaling of the pattern under of interest. Okay, what if you have a time series? This is all time series or self-affine, as I said before. So here's a time series on the right. Doesn't matter what it is, but there's some important points. The blue is the actual data. The red is a run is a yeah a running mean. You must never in the fractal analysis smooth your data because when you smooth it, you're taking out the roughness at the smaller scale. Am I done? Or have I got time? All right, I'll, I'll go right to the last slide. All right, so there's spectral density. You do a Fourier transform. You square the amplitudes. You plot it. There it is in log log space. There's the result. Let me keep going. This is a different one called size number. These are models, mathematical models that have, t if you get a certain fractal dimension, you can tell a lot about your system. Even though you might not understand the physics, you can pull to these models that are physics based. Uh, what's the relation between fractals, chaos theory, and complexity? Here's an attractor, the Rossler attractor. This little section through it is called the Poincare section. The spacing inside these attractors, wherever you take it, is a fractal. So the fractals are the geometry of chaotic systems. All right. Here's another one for complexity, and you have the uh, sand waves uh, as another example. I'm almost done. I want to get to this slide. Software, for measuring this, you can write your own software or you can purchase software. This is a company that's been in business for 25 years. I know all about it because I'm the founder of it. And there are 10 different fractal methods already programmed. So all I have to do is read in your data and it will do the analysis. And it's got box counting and cube counting and spectral analysis and many others. So you can go to that website and take a look at that. But I'll also tell you that we're about to release the end of next semester, so probably in June, online a free fractal analysis uh, software that will cover most of the same techniques. It's a project that my students have been working on for the last year. Finally, there are two journals, the International Journal of Fractals, the AGU, EGU journal called Nonlinear Processes. Those are the two prominent journals for people publishing fractal analyses, but they're not the only ones. AGU journals, there's thousands of papers with fractal analysis of various geophysical patterns. Here's two books, and here's two more books. All right, so I will stop there and turn it over to Sean. So, good morning. Let's see, is this, no, yeah. I don't have to switch. Okay, you can go ahead, make the transition. Oop. No. Okay, we're just trying to uh, get the, the slide switched. Is that what it's supposed to be? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, right. So, so. All right. um, we have to do this. And let's see if I want, to. okay. Right, okay. So, um, uh, Chris told you about essentially fractal sets, that means those are sets of points 
which uh, have a scale invariant symmetry. Uh, if you blow them up or blow them down, they have some st the statistical relation between the, the scales, which doesn't depend on a characteristic size. Um, what I want to go do now is to make a transition to time series transex fields. In other words, instead of just you're on the set, you're off the set, it's black or white, but in fact, um, whoops. Um, but in fact, the field has a value, such as the temperature or wind at every point. Um, and so, okay, I'll just give you an idea here. The top graph is uh, a fairly, uh, well, order, well, more or less ordinary looking uh, transect, actually. It's an airplane, airplane transect of the temperature at something like 12 kilometers. Uh, but it's actually hiding extremely strong intermittency. And so you're going to, you may recognize some of your own data in this. Um, it doesn't look anything uh, particularly wild or spectacular, but if I take the first differences, so I just take successive points, the differences, the absolute difference, and I normalize it, in this case, by the standard deviation, then you see the thing at the bottom, what I call a spike plot. And uh, you can see that the largest spike here is actually nearly 17 standard deviations which if the process was Gaussian would mean 10 to the minus 50 or something, right? So this is completely outside the can of anything re resembling a Gaussian process. Um, and uh, yet it looked quite uh, sort of innocent to start with. So what I've done here is I've taken this, what I call a spike plot, put it at the top here, and then I've degraded it successively by factors of four. Okay, so you can see what's going on. All these spikes are clustered in a hierarchical way. So I degrade, 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 and you can still see that there's a big predominance uh, even after many, many degradations in the scale for here. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be first trying to make a model which goes the other way, starts from something more or less smooth at the bottom and builds up this, these strong spikes to smaller and smaller scales, a cascade process, and then we're going to be analyzing the data by degrading these spikes like this. And there's going to be a scale ratio lambda, which is the ratio of the overall scale of the data divided by the resolution here. So lambda is always going to be greater than 1. OK, so uh, the simplest way of making a model that does this is called the alpha model. There's two states. You either decrease or you boost. Um, so OK, you start over here. Everything is a unit. You decrease or boost by flipping a coin. And uh, if you make the coin so that I have this little multiplicative factor, mu epsilon, so it's either the scale ratio, in this case, 2. So lambda is 2 to some power. It's either a, a gamma minus or a gamma plus. And then uh, I'm going to be multiply. I'm going to be repeating this many, many times. Uh, so the overall field at some point is going to be the product of many, many uh, of these factors. And you get something like this. So depending on the various parameters, I have either this process on the left, which gets built up, the, the variability whoops, uh, gets built up um, like this, or a, a different set of parameters. It could be like this, so, but very, very spiky. You can see the scales here are constantly changing. And the statistics of this, though, are the same at every level. As long as I um, work out the statistics in terms of this thing called the singularity gamma, which is just the uh, exponent. Remember, lambda is the ratio of scales. And then the probabilities are also the same at every scale. At least the, it's the, actually the exponent of the probabilities that are the same at every scale. It's this thing called C of gamma, which is a co-dimension function. So it's going to be, in this case, 1 minus the dimension of the spikes at some level. And so you can write the probability um, of this, the function exceeding a, a threshold. It depends on the resolution lambda to this power gamma. And then the probabilities uh, similarly. And then the statistical moments, if the other way of characterizing the probabilities are through the statistical moments. So I have this other exponent, k of q, where q is the moment that uh, I'm interested in. So in a, to understand this in some kind of theoretical context, I could have a fluctuation. It's in this case, the temperature um, over some time interval delta t. And it could be um, some driving dynamical process phi, and then times a, a, a la the interval delta t to some power h. And so this, 
the amplitude of these normalized spikes, this is the fluctuation delta t over the average fluctuation, is in fact just a normalized um, uh, flux here. So it has a simple interpretation that way. So you can see it again here, these are more spikes, and you can then, so the spikes could be labeled like that. Well, that's a, a gamma one is one level, um, and the co-dimension is C of gamma one, and the fractal dimension of the set of points exceeding this is D of gamma one, and similarly for another level. Um, okay, so right away we can see this will lead to a limitation in uh, our interpretation of spectra. So here is a multifractal simulation, 2,000 points here. Um, doesn't look all that spectacular. If I make a spike plot, you can see, however, that I have these massive spikes, and this is already this level 10 to the minus 10 if it was Gaussian here, so these huge spikes hiding. But when you look at these thing, this thing in Fourier space, here's the spectrum. Um, so the spectrum is in black here, but the, and the ensemble spectrum is in blue. If I did an uh, infinite number of these processes, I would get the blue. But what I'm seeing is I'm seeing all these huge spikes in Fourier space, which in fact even one would be 10 to the minus 6 in probability level if this was a Gaussian process. So many people have done this type of analysis, gone to Fourier space, said, oh, I have a big spike in Fourier space. I, I assume that the fluctuations are Gaussian in Fourier space. And then, ah, I can reject that hypothesis with huge amounts of confidence. So therefore, I have some oscillating process. But actually, it's simply that you're, you have the wrong um, uh, null hypothesis there. Um, so you get all kinds of spurious uh, interpretations uh, of data that way. OK, so once again, this is the, the, the way the statistics go. These exponents for the probabilities are related to the exponents of the um, moments in this relatively simple, this very simple way, in fact, called the Legendre transform, it's very elegant. And also, you can see that the statistics depend on an entire function such as C of gamma. It's not just one number, it's a whole function that's invariant, a scale invariant. And uh, so it's like an infinite number of parameters. So if that's all you could say, the system would be pretty much unmanageable and useless. But it turns out that there are universal, universality classes. So in practice, you're only going to be dealing with essentially two parameters for the spikes, a C1 and an alpha which makes it a huge simplification. You could apply, so how do I apply this to data? Well, all I have to do is, remember I worked out the, first of all, the spikes, and then I just degraded them by averaging. And so here I have uh, atmospheric data, the east-west wind, north-west, north-south wind, temperature, humidity, and I've taken data at 200 kilometer resolution, I worked out the spikes, and then I just degrade them, uh, for the, and then I look at the second order moment at 1.8, 1.6, 1.5, whoops, um, et cetera. And these are moments less than one down here. And you can see so on a log log plot, beautiful scaling. You can see that the process, the cascade process responsible started at about the size of the Earth. There's a kind of an effective outer scale a little bit larger than 20,000 kilometers because that's the scale at which the process would have had no variability. And even at 20,000 kilometers, there is still some residual variability. So you have excellent um, scaling of these spikes in all of this atmospheric data. So the cascades really do start at this large scale. OK, so that's, those were looking at spikes directly. But often, it's useful to look at fluctuations. And so if I look at, say, the delta t, the fluctuation in the temperature, the various powers, I just do this ensemble average of the equation I had before, and you can see that I get this spike exponent, k of q here, but I get a, a linear thing here, depending on this h, which is the, um, the, the extra scaling here. So uh, if I want, I can get all the information by looking at fluctuations instead of spikes. And the problem is that you're used to fluctuations just being differences, just the temperature here minus the temperature there is the fluctuation over this interval. Um, you could also look at fluctuations by anomalies. So you remove a long-term trend, and then you average over a certain scale. And you see how quickly, by averaging more and more, you kill the variability. So it turns out, though, that what you really need for most geoprocesses is, is something called a Haar fluctuation. Haar fluctuation just combines those two ideas. So the Haar fluctuation of the temperature between my two hands here is the average of the first half of the interval minus the average of the second half of the interval. That's it. 
And so when you do that, you can get a, a picture like this for temperatures um, uh, going from less than a second up to hundreds of millions of years over here. And you can see that you get a number of more or less straight line, um, so power law, fractal regimes, weather, macro weather, climate, macro climate, mega climate. Um, OK, and the transitions are OK. So I'm just about done here. Um, just, uh, let's see, you could look at intermittency. From that, I have two examples, one of low intermittency at the top and high intermittency at the bottom. And you can look at the root mean square fluctuation, and this one is in the one in space. And you could just look at the average fluctuation. And you can see on this log-log plot that they are converging. So they're not parallel. If this was a Gaussian process, they would be parallel, like they are in the bottom, which is in time. So this is low intermittency, high intermittency, and you can estimate the amount of intermittency by taking the ratio, actually, of the, uh, the this is the mean to the RMS. There I go, that's the end. Uh, so the moral of this part of the talk is that um, scaling processes generally lead to series transex fields, so these are multifractals. Uh, they, they have these hidden spikes extremely often. I could give you zillions of examples. Uh, they can be modeled by cascade processes and analyzed by just degrading the spikes. That's what I call trace moment analysis. Or if you prefer, you can analyze the fluctuations. But warning, f using just differences as fluctuations are often not adequate um, because differences on average can only increase. Um, whereas sometimes you have a negative H exponent where you have fluctuations decreasing with scale and you need, um, in fact, these hard fluctuations then. So thank you very much. Um, I hope that was useful.